uh, for everybody who's here, welcome. Good morning. Um, it, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce my good friend and colleague, uh, Dan Ho. Um, uh, Dan is a um, associate professor of neurosurgery at the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida. Um, uh, I've known Dan for 10 years. Uh, we were uh, fellows together in Cleveland, and, uh, um, and, uh, and we had uh, great times there, including going to the, probably the coldest Florida game you could ever go to at the Brown Stadium. Um, uh, it's been my pleasure to see Dan uh, rising through the ranks uh, of uh, both clinically and also uh, within organized neurosurgery. Uh, he's currently the, the secretary of the uh, joint uh, spine section um, and also uh, treasurer for the CNS. Um, and uh, and uh, he's, he's a great surgeon, great guy. Um, and uh, he's going to talk to us today about the current concepts in uh, cervical spinal alignment. So thanks a lot, Dan, for coming. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dan. It's a, r a real honor. Um, you know, uh, Dan, and as he said, he, he and I have been, uh, you know, friends and like brothers since we were co-fellows back in Cleveland 10 years ago. And in the spine world, uh, you know, Dan Resnick and Greg Trost have been real mentors and big brothers uh, to me. And so I, I really appreciate uh, the invitation. I, I, I'll say, uh, um, you know, this is the world we are in now with virtual webinar. You know, that's one of the unfortunate uh, realities of this COVID year. I'll, I'll say, if there's any one good thing that came out of COVID is, uh, you know, I grew up in Nebraska, so I'm a Nebraska uh, Cornhuskers football fan. So it looks like the Badgers' total domination of the Huskers uh, in football. <laughs> Uh, may hopefully be postponed <laughs> one year. So, uh, in any event, yeah, right. We'll just replay the old games and, and uh, that's right. That's right. That's <laughs> pretend right. like we never saw him before. Dan was gracious enough not to send me a text at the end of those games the last several <laughs> years. Yeah, you know, so I appreciate that. <laughs> anyway, well, I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. I know we're you know, we have some a lot of time schedule here. So, uh, this is a, as I said, a, a topic about cervical spinal alignment. I'm sure, you know. Uh, many of the, the residents and, and their fellows are, are aware of this being at a place, a program like Wisconsin. Um, and this is not really a science talk, but I'll just talk about, um, you know, kind of how I how I see this and we'll talk about some cases and so forth. So um, that's how I, I, my only disclosure, I, I am on the editorial board for the spine drill. In fact, uh, Dan Resnick really trailblazed and opened this door for me. And so I get a very small stipend uh, for that. And so that, that's obviously not relevant to the talk we're having uh, today. I'll start with the case. Um, a patient that was uh, sent to me by a, a community orthopedic surgeon who uh, I think really kind of highlights um, uh, the example of uh, how one um, maybe small bad choice leads to another bad decision to another bad decision how things can very quickly kind of fall apart. So um, this is a 49-year-old uh, guy who had presented the surgeon uh, with complaints of neck pain and uh, symptoms of, uh, got cut off here, but cervical radiculopathy. He has this, uh, this sagittal a T2 weighted MR that shows, um, you know, some degenerative uh, kyphosis at the uh, uh, subaxial spine, and even the axis show multi-level branchial stenosis. And, um, and and before I keep going, uh, if, if this should be open and informal. So if, if any of the residents have any questions, I have my chat box open, so I'll, I'll try to make sure to look at that. Um, and so this is the um, planned surgery that the, the outside surgeon had performed, which was a multi-level. Um, corpectomy with an expandable cage and anterior plate. And uh, uh, it sounds like after surgery, the patient had very severe uh, dysphagia. Um, and so, and we can critique this uh, as well, but in any event, he then elected to take him back to surgery to remove the plate. I guess the thought was that the anterior plate was causing a dysphagia and to do a posterior supplemental fixation um, and uh, did not quite cross the levels of the uh, corpectomy with the posterior fixation. Um, and again, we can critique that as well. Um, and so this was his post-op x-ray, and you can see he's got this multi-level um, corpectomy with a big expandable cage, uh, posterior fixation. He's really now kyphosing further into significant cervical um, positive sagittal imbalance. So the outside surgeon put him in a halo with an attempt to try and stabilize him and, and, um, and send him to see me. Um, and again, we can go take the halo here. I think you know, many people are aware that halo, unfortunately, is not that adequate at stabilizing the uh, lower cervical spinal cervical thoracic junction. So this is his x-ray in clinic when he saw me. He was in a halo. The guy was miserable. You can see his head all the way forward, and he's hyperextending his neck. 
Um, and so I admitted into the hospital. We, we, we got him in traction and, uh, and, and really tried to get as much correctional traction as possible. This is um, uh, his post-traction film. And, and not perfect, but uh, tried to get him at least some reasonable um, cervical sagittal alignment. And this is locked into an halo now. And um, this is a CT scan uh, in the halo. Um, so again, not perfect, but but maybe better than 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 what he started with, and and then and then and, and uh, then definitively um, uh, internally fixate him. And and, I, and I'm going to be the first one to say that this is not an ideal construct. Unfortunately, all of the lateral mass screws that had been put in uh, had pulled out, um, and so we did not have great fixation. And so. Um, uh, this is what we were, ended up with, and at least we're able to get him locked in. And he, believe it, and I kept him in a halo actually after this. And believe it or not, believe it or not, he did actually eventually go on to fuse and heal. So, so I, I think I kind of got away with maybe not an ideal construct there, but at least got him uh, better than I started. So, so I, I bring up this case is how do we get from this, which is uh, something we probably see very commonly in our in our spine practices, to this, um, and then and unfortunately now a guy who's locked, you know, from the occiput to upper thoracic. Uh, fusion. So, I think this really gets back to basic biomechanical principles, and I and I'm sure this comes up, uh, you know, with Dan and Greg and 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 Dan and and the other you know spine faculty at at your program. You know, this is really a really basic fundamental biomechanical principle that that you know Ed Benzel mentors to all of us. Um, you know, uh, um, I think brought to the forefront is this idea of this instantaneous axis rotation, which is that for any object in space, there's a point at which if you apply force to it, that the object will rotate. And the idea being is that if you have an instantaneous axis rotation, a single point in space where an object will rotate, you know, where you apply that force, whether you're ventral to it or, or dorsal to it, actually affects how that object will rotate. So oftentimes we use that in a simple model. We talk about something like a burst fracture or a compression fracture, a single vertebral segment. But even multiple segments or, or so, or, uh, such as the whole cervical spine in and of itself can have an instantaneous axis rotation. And um, that instantaneous axis rotation is not a fixed uh, point. In fact, it's, it's relative to the whole um, uh, region and, uh, and can be different depending on the alignment. So if you have a normal lordotic cervical spine, yeah, then the instantaneous axis rotation for the whole lordotic cervical spine is probably slightly behind um, uh, the midpoint of the cervical spine. If you have a, a straight cervical spine, then it might run actually right through the center part. But the challenging situation here in kyphosis, when you have a, a, a relatively kyphotic cervical spine, that instantaneous axis rotation is probably in front of uh, the spine itself. And so in this case, with a cervical kyphosis across multiple segments, that instantaneous axis rotation was probably ventral to the kyphotic segments. And so the expandable cage idea, again, to, to cr critique perhaps the original surgeon's idea here was, was that I think the idea of ventral distraction on paper sounds like a good way to correct kyphosis, but, you know, in, in, in reality, that cage was actually dorsal to the instantaneous axis rotation for that for that individual patient. And so that distraction actually was occurring, the expandable cage dorsal to the instantaneous axis rotation, which we know dorsal distraction actually pushes people further into kyphosis. And I think that's exactly what happened in this case. And then subsequent, you know, you know, bad decisions, you know, removing the anterior plate, push your fixation, not crossing the levels and so forth, I think led to this, um, this result, and, and as as uh, as Benzel's famous was saying, kyphosis begets kyphosis. Once you go down this path, then it, it tends to, um, in, a, in in a glacial way, sort of escalate. So, uh, just an introductory kind of case to illustrate how our biomechanical principles really affect uh, how we think about decision making. So, how do we measure cervical sagittal alignment? And so, first, if we're going to talk about sagittal alignment, how do we characterize it? So, uh, just Historically, um, the original ideas behind cervical alignment was really mainly sort of characterizing sort of the morphology of the cervical spine. And there's a couple different ways, the Toyama method, which is just a simple vertical line on a lateral x-ray from C2 to C7, and, you know, how many vertebral bodies are in front of it versus behind it. The Cobb angle, which I think we're all very familiar with, is a way of sort of measuring 
uh, and angles uh, the overall cervical lordosis, and that's something we still do today. But kind of more recently, the idea of, of balance or sagittal balance, and certainly in the thoracic lumbar spine, has gained a lot of um, uh, recognition. But even in the cervical spine, we're sort of getting the idea that the actual balance of the cervical spine, not just the morphology of the alignment, but the actual balance itself has an importance with relative to function and outcome. And so um, this is actually not a new idea. The chin-brow vertical angle is, a, is an older method, which is really simple. It's just a tangential line from the forehead to the chin measured relative to the vertical axis. And that gives us an idea of sort of horizontal gaze. And that really kind of came, I think, from the ankylosing spondylitis uh, literature of how you know, we think about uh, horizontal gaze or forward gaze in patients that have a relatively fixed kyphosis. But now we're starting to apply principles that we know from thoracal lumbar sagittal alignment to cervical sagittal alignment, things like a plumb line, a C2, C7 sagittal vertical axis. Taking that one step further, recognizing again from the thoracal lumbar experience that the base of our spine has real relevance to the amount of lordosis that we need to maintain balance, that if we were to apply that to the cervical or cervical thoracic spine, that this idea of the T1 slope or the T1 angle really is important. In other words, how horizontal versus oblique your T1 angle really dictates how much cervical lordosis you need to maintain an upright head position. And so that's really kind of where we're at in terms of uh, radiographic characters, cervical sagittal line or balance. Let's talk a little bit about the natural history of cervical uh, kyphosis, cervical sagittal alignment. So we know that uh, in general, life is a gradual process of kyphosis, uh, and that is sort of a natural process of aging. This is a population study done in Japan, which showed by each, for each decade, I'm not going to go through all the numbers here, but, it, but in general, for each decade in life, if you look at all these parameters like sagittal vertical axis and whatnot, there is a natural normal aging process of loss of sagittal uh, alignment over time. And sure enough, if you start to correlate with those with certain functional measures like ODI or EQ5D, there's a correlation there. So that really gets to what is the impact of cervical sagittal alignment. So this was a, 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 a cadaver study done by the late uh, Charlie Coons where they actually measured uh, spinal cord intramedullary pressure um, uh, based on various cervical alignments. Again, this was in a cadaver. And there was a cut point at which um, when the sagittal alignment became significantly imbalanced, that the intramedullary pressure uh, increases. And so the idea that, uh, which is not a new idea, that, that there is potentially a position and alignment component to spinal cord compression. I just thought this as, a, as a, a unique example. I'm sure Dan and Greg and, and Dan have seen cases like this. This is a, a young guy who was referred to me with severe um, uh, cervical myelopathy. He had this X-ray and this MR. It didn't really show any spinal cord compression at all, but there was clearly something abnormal going on. There was this wasting and atrophy in the distal cord, the cervical cord. And uh, he had an astute uh, neurologist who actually ended up getting um, – collection MRI, and this is Hirayama disease, right? So this is uh, with kyphosis uh, or function of the neck, you get severe spinal cord compression that alleviates with extension. So just as an example, this sort of a, a one-off, but an unusual example where positions of the neck actually can affect uh, spinal cord compression. So how does our baseline alignment then, what data do we have on baseline alignment and uh, its impact on uh, cervical uh, uh, myelopathy or cervical function? So this was uh, an, the uh, AO spine North American multicenter uh, registry data. And sure enough, they did a, a correlation and they found that sagittal alignment or sagittal balance in the cervical spine significantly correlates with uh, things like JOA or modified JOA score. So there's definitely uh, a correlation between positive sagittal cervical imbalance with uh, cervical myelopathy. How about other uh, ways we characterize cervical dysfunction? So neck disability index, and 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 this is again also I believe from um, um, from a multicenter registry. They certainly showed that the uh, there is a correlation between cervical lordosis open T1 um, slope minus cervical lordosis. So this would be sort of like the cervical corollary to uh, what's called pelvic incidence on lordosis mismatch. So there was a correlation between even neck disability and cervical sagittal alignment. And so now knowing that at baseline that there's a correlation between sagittal alignment and myelopathy and neck disability, 
how do we think about the surgical procedures we do every day? And, and I, I love this quote from, from Ed Benzel. I, I know I, I referenced him a lot, but um, <clears throat> he says, every fusion surgery that we do is a deformer surgery. You're either treating the deformity or creating one. So again, how do our different everyday routine cervical spine surgical procedures affect overall sagittal alignment? So uh, uh, this is, I, I'm not gonna go through an exhaustive review of every literature, but you know, I, I wanted to highlight some studies that just did some comparisons. For example, you know, a one level ACDF or a two level ACDF. And this is one of the most common surgeries in the Medicare population that we do today, right? And believe it or not, uh, an ACDF, whether it's one level or two level, it doesn't really significantly improve our sagittal alignment, even though we think that it does. In fact, you look at this data, it's only a few degrees um, that we see improvement per level in terms of focal lordosis, and even less so when we start talking about the overall regional alignment. How about if you could compare a two-level ACDF versus a one-level corpectomy? So again, two procedures done for relatively similar indications, meaning two-level uh, cervical spinal cord compression. And again, we know the two-level ACDF, uh, a few degrees per level. But what I would tell you from a simple biomechanical uh, principle standpoint, the corpectomy, over time, what you get is you get a loss of, uh, uh, of that very minimal alignment correction over time uh, from subsidence. And this is, again, a very basic uh, biomechanical principle that that intermediate point of fixation really does have an important role in terms of preservation or maintenance of that alignment. How about a single level ACDF versus a total disc replacement, right? So um, if an ACDF gives you very minimal uh, improvement in segmental alignment, shouldn't a disc replacement, which is a motion preserving procedure, give you even better than that? And it turns out from a regional alignment, not really any different, only a few degrees. And actually, if you look at a device level, at the actual device or the index level, if anything, you actually see better segmental lordosis with an ACDF versus a total disc replacement. And the, and the logic there is, is because with a total disc replacement, you can't oversize the, the, uh, the device. It really has to be sort of pressed set perfectly for, for the native um, disc space height, whereas an ACDF, you might be able to slightly oversize that. So again, even with a total disc replacement, we're not seeing significant improvements with that. How about hybrid approaches? So multi-level ACDF, hybrid, so an ACDF over a corpectomy versus a multi-level corpectomy. And, and again, it, uh, I won't go through all this, but really that intermixation from a hybrid gives you a much better maintenance or preservation of alignment than a multi-level corpectomy. Posterior surgery. So this is a laminoplasty versus laminectomy infusion. Uh, this was a retrospective study done on UCSF. And so there's some selection bias here that's inherent in this data, meaning that certain patients Patients that underwent laminoplasty were more likely to have baseline better lordosis than those that underwent laminectomy infusion. But I think the important thing here was that, that with both procedures, they're able to uh, um, show a relative preservation and uh, uh, maintenance of lordosis over time, even though laminoplasty is not a fusion procedure. And, and again, there's been some data to suggest that there's some loss of lordosis over time with laminoplasty. In this study, which was only up, up to about a year and a half post-op um, follow-up, there was relative preservation of lordosis with these procedures. What they did show is when they pooled the data that, uh, again, to, to, to um, go along with what we'd seen previously, that, that, that a maintenance of lordosis uh, correlated with better uh, um, functional outcomes than those that had uh, um, sagittal uh, imbalance on their post-op x-rays. Just to close this out, in terms of devices themselves, you know, there's been a lot of interest in standalone uh, anti-cervical devices versus plate. And again, uh, even though standalone devices may have some fixations, they don't have quite the same fixations plate. So what you see is, is that there's a loss of uh, segmental alignment over time with a standalone device compared to a conventional plate and inner body graft. And then the type of inner body device. So uh, this is a study comparing uh, titanium uh, cages versus peak cages. Um, and uh, so how you choose your inner body device. Um, and so titanium, which has a much stiffer or lower modulus elasticity than peak, uh, showed greater subsidence, uh, meaning that there was a mismatch between the uh, modulus elasticity of the, of the titanium cage versus the bone and the end plate surface. And that oversizing the cage was correlated with more subsidence. And so how we think about the device itself, the material and how we size them has a relationship to our uh, uh, segmental alignment. So what is the impact now of our post-op sagittal alignment on actual neurological and functional outcomes? So this was, uh, again, a study, I think this was looking actually at the AO spine uh, registry. And so 
across uh, all, multiple sort of myelopathy scales. So MJOA, Neurig, and 30-minute walk test. Um, you can see that there was, uh, um, if you looked at the whole cohort of patients undergoing surgery for cervical myelopathy, there was an improvement in MJOA. But if you really separated it out by those who had a lordotic post alignment versus a kyphotic post alignment, the outcome was much better in terms of recovery uh, for those with lordotic alignment, post-op, and kyphosis. And that was true across all these other uh, measurements as well. This was um, Zogo Gowala's um, uh, study uh, for um, uh, CSM. And they did a, a post hoc analysis. This was actually a study to compare anterior versus posterior surgery for cervical myelopathy. They did a post hoc analysis uh, to assess whether or not post operative cervical sagittal balance had importance. And I, this is kind of a maybe not necessarily an intuitive graph, but what this graph shows is that if you draw an arbitrary line at four centimeters of post operative positive cervical sagittal imbalance, the probabilities of MJOA improvement is better um, if you have less than four centimeters of positive sagittal imbalance post-op compared to if you have greater than four centimeters. And when they then just divided that into uh, posterior versus anterior surgery again, because that was the original impetus of the study, um, you can see that uh, those that underwent anterior surgery, most of them fell within the less than four centimeter positive sagittal alignment, and, and a little and majority had a high probability of improvement. When you looked at posterior surgery, there were patients that fell into the less, a greater than four centimeter positive sagittal alignment, and the probabilities of improvement, sorry, this was not MGOA, this was SF36, um, was, was, was there was, that, 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 that for posterior surgery, if you were, uh, had postoperative positive sagittal alignment, your probabilities of improvement were not good. How about adjacent segment disease? So this is just one study that looked at post-operative um, uh, segmental alignment. And if you had even just a lordotic versus a kyphotic post-operative alignment, segmental alignment, and sure enough, they just drew a line in the sand between those that had less than zero degrees of segmental alignment post-operatively versus greater than zero degrees. The adjacent segment disease rate was markedly different, 61% versus 27%. So, so that segmental alignment may have real impact in terms of adjacent segment disease rate. So again, um, every fusion surgery, a deformity surgery, you're eating treating deformity, you're creating one. I'll just take a, a side note and say that uh, my feelings about how I treat diseases personally changed quite a bit. In fact, uh, for, for multi-level disease now, I, I really um, have shifted more towards trying to um, perform laminoplasties, which are, are more motion uh, relatively speaking, motion preserving uh, procedures rather than um, uh, fusion surgeries. And certainly I think one of the things that I'm seeing in that, uh, is that those patients that uh, end up having multi-level uh, ACDFs, three and four level ACDFs um, are now coming back with quite significant um, positive cervical vaginal balance. That then becomes a, a much more difficult problem to treat. That will take me to the last part of this talk. I, I think we have about 10 or 15 minutes. I'll, I'll go through this. this is, uh, really just a, a handful of cases about, you know, when someone then does have um, now sagittal, cervical sagittal imbalance, you know, what are our techniques for correcting this and how do we think about uh, decision making? So this was a, a paper um, uh, uh, published by Mike Simon, a former fellow at University of Wisconsin um, and Ed Benzel uh, a number of years ago that kind of came up with a basic sort of algorithm of how you think about cervical deformity correction. It was really based around this concept, which I think is uh, it's probably intuitive, is, is, is whether you have a fixed versus a non-fixed uh, deformity. And, and in their algorithm, they, they chose to, to, to define that by um, responsiveness to traction. Um, we wrote a, a review paper that was published not too long ago in Neurospine uh, on cervical deformity techniques and, and came up with this uh, algorithm, which is which is not that much different, but I think starts to incorporate kind of more advanced uh, deformity correction techniques. Um, and, and, and like any algorithm, it's not dogmatic and not perfect, but uh, this is kind of how we define this, you know, again, defining non-fixed uh, versus fixed deformities. We'll go to some, some cases to illustrate this, but 
so a non-fixed deformity and 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 cervical deformity with only a, a few levels or less of ventral compression, then anterior approaches like ACDF might be um, appropriate. If you have more than three levels, then a posterior uh, approach with multi-level um, Smith Pete osteotomies and decompression fusion is appropriate. When you have fixed deformities, um, then it starts to become into some of the more advanced uh, deformity correction techniques. If it's a focal kyphosis, um, if possible, some kind of anterior release through an anterior cervical um, osteotomy or, or corpectomy. If it's diffusely kyphotic and it's an ankylosing picture, then we're talking about a very specific technique, and I have a case to demonstrate this. Uh, whereas if it's not diffusely ankylosed, then again, some of these more um, advanced or three column osteotomy techniques. So um, the ISSG, the International Spine Study Group, uh, published a paper where they classified the various different types of uh, cervical osteotomy techniques and graded them. So um, from, from least invasive to most invasive. So grade ones were ACDF, uh, Smith-Peterson osteotomies, grade twos, multilevel corpectomy, Great, uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, sorry, grade two is an anterior osteotomy, so it's a, um, I'm sorry, this is a, uh, I'm sorry, so Peterson osteotomy, grade uh, two is a, grade three is a, a corpectomy, grade four is a discectomy extended out to uh, resect also the uncovertebral joint. Grade five is a posterior extension osteotomy, which is really mainly for uh, ankylitis. Grade six is a pedicle subtraction osteotomy, and grade seven is a vertebral column resection. So just to go to some cases, this is a, a, a gentleman I saw who had, again, this degenerative cervical kyphosis, uh, multi-levels uh, um, with uh, subluxation at C2, C3, uh, core, core compression. And um, really, even his core compression was really mainly at these top three levels between C2, 3, 3, 4, and 4, 5. So um, I went down this pathway with a non-fixed. Um, the ventral compression was primarily three levels. Um, and uh, multi-level ACDF now, um, and that's what this is, looks like on the ISSG osteotomy, osteotomy classification. So you'll look at this and say I did more than three levels of ACDF, but really, again, the main levels here were to correct the kyphosis, and this was really just to enhance the overall rigidity and fusion, and this was the supplemental posterior fixation. <clears throat> is that a broken uh, plate? No, it's not. So... Um, Poor planning, uh, I, I, they didn't have a four-level plate in the set. Um, and so, I, uh, and, and I don't want people to think that I routinely do five-level ACDF, but um, um, I knew I was backing them up, so they didn't have a four-level plate in the set, so I did a three-level plate and a, a buttress plate uh, for the bottom level, and then we turned them over to the posterior fixation. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah think, I think, uh, sorry, Dan, I was just going to comment yeah. also, you know, some, some some people will uh, just you know in some way try and keep the grafts from sliding out anteriorly while they flip the patient and then just once they get the posterior instrumentation and they don't don't even necessarily need yeah. a plate so yeah yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I kind of guessed that you were doing something along those lines but, yeah. yeah yeah that that would have been better that, that made it on purpose but I think I really think yeah. it was just that <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to cover right. you Dan um, yeah thanks. <laughs> This is a guy, young guy who had a remote history of um, uh, IV drug use, uh, and that's going to be a recurring theme, I think, of the last few cases here, um, and had this chronic cervical kyphosis. Um, this was a, um, um, so neck pain, kyphosis, um, went down this pathway, non-fixed. Uh, I guess you wouldn't really call this compression, but he had multiple, more, more than three levels, and so I thought this would be a good case for a posture push for multi-level Smith-Peterson osteotomy. I did put them in traction first. Uh, I just included this because I, I started doing this uh, for some cases like this. I, I, you know, when when intraoperatively, I've, you know, when you when I've tried to uh, extend somebody manually intraoperatively, I find that a, a lot of the force unfortunately gets dissipated at the craniocervical junction, um, and so I put a temporary occipital plate uh, and connect a temporary rod uh, to the upper levels, and uh, and that way when I nearly uh, extend them intraoperatively, all of that force gets transmitted to below um, the temporary rod. So you, you can see you get quite a significant amount of um, manual reduction. Again, this is all done under intraoperative neuromonitoring. You get quite significant uh, transmission of that force to the, um, to the subaxial spine. And of course, they take off the uh, occipital plate and the, uh, 
contemporary rod, and that was the uh, um, most opposite. So um, again, it's non-fixed. So I grew on osteotomy, spent Peters in osteotomies, and, and this was, I think, at about a year uh, or two post-op. Interestingly enough, he actually then fused through all those uh, disc spaces, um, and this was as uh, post-op call. Um, now, kind of moving to some of the more um, um, uh, advanced techniques. This is a, a guy I used to cover our VA. This is a, a patient who came to our VA, um, had a ACDF and posterior fixation, um, pseudoarthrosis, um, and then eventual um, subsidence across his um, um, ACDF and had this pretty fixed deformity. You know, this CT scan, I think. I would just suggest sort of uh, underrepresents. He was really a, almost a chin on chest when he sat up. His chin was really on his uh, sternum there, and so this is what it looked like on CT. So cervical sort of deformity. This is uh, to me a fixed deformity because uh, it's really a focal kyphosis. And so trying to do an anterior release to try and get that open, and then uh, and then correct it, and then uh, and then definitive stabilization. So that's what it looked like on the operating table. So there's blankets here, but I assure you, if we remove these blankets, his head would be elevated off the bed like this is about a quarter we could get. So um, I'll just, uh, a wrinkle to this, this was done at our VA where we didn't have neuromonitoring available to us, uh, which is not how I would recommend doing any of these procedures. So, um, but we had what we had. So um, I actually staged this, um, did an anterior approach, um, removed uh, most of his plate um, and did the anterior column, uh, anterior uh, corpectomy take out his posterior fixation. And then I actually sent him to the, uh, to the monitor unit in a halo. And then we did gradual uh, reduction uh, awake uh, based on volume attraction. And so then, and then once we got him corrected, got him locked into a halo. So this is now him locked in halo. And that's why you see the defect there. So we actually had to stage it. And then I brought him back as a second stage um, uh, to uh, um, do the um, um, strut graft and plate and then posterior fixation. So, um, again, if we go down this uh, osteotomy classification, the uh, anterior uh, corpectomy uh, to release it, and then this was the definitive stabilization. This is now him sitting upright uh, post op. Dan, did you have to cut that um, plate? Is that how you? I mean, your screws are are facing the aorta, right? So, um, I, how'd you get the plate out? Boy, I must I, I must have repressed that memory. <laughs> I'm doing it. I, I think we. I think I cut the plate because I think there's still part of the plate up here. I must have cut it, and uh, just you know, just made sure we had good good protection of the of, of the midline structures. Yeah, because I think I think the plate is still part of the plate is still there, so we must have cut it. Okay. Um, this is a lady um, had uh, osteomyelitis, osteodiscitis. Uh, was treated by an outside surgeon. Um, I said epidural, sorry, epidural abscess and osteodiscitis. They did a laminectomy for the epidural abscess. Again, posterior fixation, but didn't quite cross the levels of the osteodiscitis or the junction. And then she ended up eventually coming to me now with this uh, relatively fixed uh, cervical thoracic kyphosis with the osteodiscitis. Uh, so she, you know, she, she underwent antibiotic treatment. The epidural abscess, osteodiscitis healed, the infection healed, but then she unfortunately healed in this kyphosis. Um, and on CT, it actually was um, ankylosed. So um, going down decision tree fix, I guess you could argue this is really a focal kyphosis. Um, 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 but for me, down in this tree, tree, I thought this was a better approach for a three-column osteotomy. So this is um, the uh, pedicles retraction osteotomy, grade four. Um, and so again, here you can see uh, the pre-op CT was ankylosed. Um, and so this is what it looked like post-op. So um, a pedicles retraction osteotomy at C7. And then a definitive stabilization. And I, I, just a little nuance here. I, I've been doing this with a, a, a hinged rod. You can't really quite see here, but there's a hinge here. So a couple of device or implant uh, um, companies have rods that have a hinge in them, and that allows us uh, to um, put our fixation, um, attach the uh, you know, the, co the uh, cranial and the caudal end of the hinge to the rods, but keep the hinge uh, loose, and then you can do a, a, a manual reduction. Um, to correct it without um, concern about translation or anything through the uh, osteotomy, so that's what that is. Um, last couple of cases here, I know we're running out of time. This is probably, to me, the, the most severe of the deformities. This is a guy with ankylosing spondylitis um, who um, developed a, uh, a chin-on-chest deformity that was fixed, 
in both the sagittal plane and also the coronal plane. I know this probably looks like an alien spine here. I'm not quite sure. I couldn't quite, quite get the CTs right to show what it looks like. Um, um, so the correction for this is really an older technique, which is a posterior extension osteotomy. It's, it's all done posteriorly. It's a complete resection of all the posterior elements. And then it's, um, this is not his CT. I just use this to illustrate the, the bony removal. So it's complete posterior resection. And then, um, and then an opening wedge or osteoclastic um, uh, correction through the anterior column. So if you go down this route, fixed deformity, diffusely ankylosed. And so that's really, the wedge osteotomy is really the, uh, the, the one technique for this. And this is what it looks like on the osteotomy classification system. This is the guy's um, gout. And so this is, uh, again, this is not his CT. This is just to demonstrate the technique. So it's, you remove the posterior elements and it's a, um, a, uh, I guess the best way to describe it is almost like an iatrogenic fracture dislocation to open up that wedge in the front. And this is what it looks like. Um, and then supplemental posterior fixation. So it's an opening wedge osteotomy. And then because they're ankylosing spinalis, they tend to heal very well and fuse very well. So this is what they look like um, pre-op on the table. So you can see he has a chin on chest and his head was locked on a coronal um, tilt. Um, and then this is him post-op. And I'm just going to... Uh, the uh, transfer here, you know, these are unfortunately quite morbid procedures. Um, uh, in my experience, has been many of them have difficulty swallowing and breathing afterwards because their esophagus they can essentially get uh, contracted in this chronic condition. And so, as you correct them, they get an elongated and stretched esophagus. They have a lot of difficulty with swallowing and breathing. So, uh, my experience has been um, a significant number of them end up with a temporary um, uh, uh, peg and, and trach. But interestingly enough, you can see how much facial edema he had uh, preoperatively, and once we corrected them. This is actually his more normal appearance. I think he was he was uh, obstructing his uh, venous outflow to his face. So again, just to highlight, I'll, I'll wrap this up here. These procedures, unfortunately, are, are not without their morbidity. Um, and uh, um, this was the ISSG published their complication rate. And I'm just going to highlight two numbers here. Um, there's not too many procedures we do uh, in, in, uh, in spine surgery that carry a 25% uh, major complication rate and a nearly 50% total complication rate. So these uh, certainly come with um, um, uh, quite significant uh, morbidity. Um, this is, a, I'll close, this is the last, uh, this is a case I'd done about a month ago. Uh, IV drug user, uh, osteodiscitis, had this kyphosis here. Um, uh, again, non-fixed. Uh, I was gonna go for a posterior approach. Um, we put her in traction. Uh, awake so she got good re reduction uh, with just traction um, and uh, so this is our intraoperative fluoro uh, this was again after just positioning not perfect but probably reasonably good um, so to put my fixation in and as the old saying goes um, you know the enemy of good is perfect I wanted to get it better so um, I actually used Songer cables as an additional technique to just tighten down this dorsal tension band to try and get a little additional few degrees of correction, which you can see it, it opens up a little bit better, uh, and then locked everything in. I uh, was really happy with this uh, intraoplural uh, correction. Um, she woke up paraplegic, um, MRI, and, uh, you know, with that, a little additional level of correction, there was buckling of the ligament flame, which I thought I had released, um, but obviously I hadn't fully, and that was just enough in a tight canal to cause um, cord compression that was symptomatic. So within an hour, got her back to the OR, laminectomy, and, and fortunately, uh, you know, we, she recovered her neurological function. Um, but uh, certainly a lesson learned about you know, little things like not fully releasing the ligament of flavum there can cause some pretty significant, you know, it's a millimeter or two difference that can be the difference. And, but she fortunately recovered her neurological function, and, and this is her uh, post-op x-ray. So again, these procedures aren't without their morbidity. So just to conclude, cervical sagittalima is, is a relevant, you know, clinical pre-op and post-op factor, and and you know we can we can characterize this now with some some more um, granular ways with low doses and sagittal vertical axis tilt, T1 slope, and it's clear that sagittal alignment is a is a is a is is is, is an important factor because it, it naturally decreases with age and with our growing aging population. It's something I think we're going to certainly see as an, an element to all of our patients, uh, and it's certainly the case that preoperatively for those who are surgical patients, worse alignment correlates with worse myelopathy and disability. 
Um, it's also clear that our various surgical approaches, even our routine procedures, ACDF, uh, multi-level ACDF, anterior corpectomy, um, can have varying degrees of effect on post-op sagittal alignment. And post-op worse alignment certainly correlates with less improvement. So how we think about our pre-op decision-making, our implants, and how we do our techniques uh, has real relevance. Um, poor set, sagittal alignment also probably increases our risk of adjacent segment degeneration. And so, you know, we are... We are really on the cusp of, of, of kind of getting a better understanding of the various techniques we have to then improve overall cervical sagittal alignment, but we certainly have a lot of work ahead of us to, to optimize the morbidity of these procedures to make them uh, more appropriate for the patients. And I'll conclude there. That was an excellent talk, Dan. Um, yeah. I just, yeah, I'll just make the comment. I, I, think, I think it's really... Uh, uh, interesting to see how the, the the fundamental kind of bread and butter procedures that we do every day have an effect overall. And I think, you know, if, if for for the residents, that's the the one of the main take home messages of this is that uh, is that um, that you can you can aggravate people's uh, alignment by the the type of procedure you choose. So you want to be careful about what you choose, even if it's just for a single level or a two level uh, uh, procedure. Dan, thank you very much, Dan. Thank you. A, a question, yeah. Dan. Can we yeah. do anything with therapy exercises to non-surgically improve alignment in early cases? Not in the not in the extreme, yeah. but in the early. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a great question. I think the you know the I want to first be clear that um, you know uh, obviously not all patients who have sagittal oh, oh, yeah. need surgery, right? In fact, you know. Um, many patients are, it's clear, are asymptomatic, minimally symptomatic, or can be managed conservatively. So um, I don't want anyone to think that uh, anyone who comes in with an x-ray in my clinic uh, leaves with, uh, you know, uh, 18 screws and two rods in their neck. But, um, um, so, so I think so. I think, you know, it's clear that there are people who are quite functional, um, even if though they have natural age-related uh, loss of settlement. And to be honest, with you, I'm not quite sure if there are certain exercises or therapies that are are that can actually reverse um, sagittal malignancy. Because I think for most people, for most people, that process is a natural age-related one. Um, mm -hmm. I think you know, in general, it's all about optimizing function and 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 setting a sort of a reasonable balance between patient expectations and whatnot. Um, I know that was a sort of vague answer to a very good question, but um, but that's how I leave it is, is that, uh, you know, it's just sort of finding the right um, balance of expectations. And, and like yeah. I said, I, I think most of these patients are treated, um, you know, conservatively. Um, and I, I think it's more an issue of if you are going to operate on somebody and there is a role for fusion, which is going to then leave them with a fixed alignment that you start to think about, you know, what is the potential impact of how you, you know, that alignment and how can you optimize that with a reasonable, uh, you know, risk benefit. Much appreciated. Much yeah. appreciated. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Uh, there was a, Dan Resnick had put a question in the chat box about IVDA and, you know, I think we're all seeing this, you know, IV drug use and how do we, you know, from, I think it's really kind of a, from a social aspect. I mean, I think we're all seeing this, unfortunately, across the country. And we, we debate this all the time, you know, you know, these are patients who frequently, come back with the current issues and, um, you know, this is really a non-compliance with their underlying disease. It's like, um, you know, uh, um, a diabetic patient who refuses to take their, you know, their diabetic meds or, uh, you know, uh, um, and, uh, you know, it's, and, you know, it's probably not a fair analogy, but it's like if you were on the, um, you know, the liver transplant list, um, and you continue to drink alcohol for alcoholic cirrhosis, you, you're not on the transplant list. You don't get a transplant. And so I know it's not quite a, same analogy, but if someone's having recurring osteoarthritis um, from IVDA and and continues, you know, sh you know, it's, a, it's an ethical question. You know, at what point do we need them to continue to perform invasive uh, surgical procedures that carry risk, morbidity, and also, you know, society cost? Um, I don't have the right answer for that. I think we probably have to look to our our uh, you know our national societies uh, to give us direction and guidance and. and uh, and, and to establish, you know, sort of um, what are the protocols for that. But it's certainly a problem that's not going away. I'll say that much. All right. Well, I think we're, we're out Absolutely. of time. I, 
yeah, you know, I, I, I appreciate yeah. the opportunity. It's quite an honor, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to meet in person <laughs> sometime soon. Oh, yeah. Good yeah. forward to Dan. Thanks again. Anything. Thanks for taking the time, Dan. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Yeah.